Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Marie Herman, and I own MRH Enterprises, LLC. I am so happy to be here today for Executive Secretary Magazine to host this week's admin chat. I'm going to be talking about troubleshooting video conferencing and what kind of steps you can take to ensure that your video conferences go as smoothly as possible. So let's get started. Today, we'll be taking a look at the overall video conferencing process, how you can identify where the failure is occurring, what you might be able to do about connection issues and some ways to address common audio issues, what kind of a backup plan you can have in case you get a disconnect, and what you can do to prevent issues from reoccurring. Now, obviously, there are some solutions that will require that you involve your information technology department, but my goal here is to see if there aren't some steps that you can take to solve the problems yourself so that you don't need to call them in, and hopefully, you'll be getting that video conference moving much more quickly in that case. So there's two basic types of virtual meetings that we'll be looking at, and there's a huge overlap between these. The terms are often used interchangeably, so, you know, just take it all with a grain of salt. But essentially, video conferencing is where companies have actual video conferencing equipment set up in their conference room. This is actual hardware with direct telecom connections that allows you to dial point to point or sometimes through um, accessing a network. They might allow sharing of desktops, in which case a second monitor is likely going to be required. Web conferencing is usually going to be multicast across the internet. It's often slightly larger groups, although it could just be two. It could be a, you know one person calling another using the internet as the tool of access, um, but it could be many more people potentially. With a traditional type of meeting, and you'll find in many of the webinar software, they distinguish between a meeting versus a webinar. So a meeting generally is small enough that everyone will be able to talk, whereas a webinar might be larger and it might be one way. So a presenter presenting to an audience may be taking Q&A through a chat, but not necessarily allowing everyone to be live on their um, audio to ask questions. But again, there's a lot of overlap between these. It's not hard and fast lines, just in general though. So video conferencing, direct video conferencing equipment in your room. Uh, many of you might use one of the more common devices like uh, Polycom devices, for example. Web conferencing is going through an internet site such as WebEx, GoToMeeting, Zoom, Microsoft Teams even is another option as well. And then there are uh, instant messenger type apps which have virtual meeting functionality in them. They often have connection by phone, uh, over the, fo over the uh, VoIP, voice over internet protocol line. So that's going through the internet and they often allow you to share your uh, picture through webcams. So that's just the general kinds of video virtual meetings we'll be talking about today. So what's happening kind of technically speaking here? Well, somewhere along the line, there is a camera at one end and data gets exchanged to end up at the other end. And we'll call that the network in the middle. When data is getting exchanged, it often runs into problems. So there might be what's called packet loss, which means essentially, if you were to send a signal from one location to another, the internet, this is a very unscientific explanation. <laughs> The internet breaks it down into tiny little packets to make it easier to, um, to send it from one location to another. If you tried to do it as one giant packet, you would get bogged down and instead they divide it out over smaller ones. But sometimes those individual packets can get lost along the way and they call that packet loss. And so that's where having the best internet connection possible will usually be a good thing during a video conference. That'll help to prevent lag, that'll help to prevent audio issues. And so we're gonna see there's a number of different issues that can happen when you're involved with the video conferencing. But when you have uh, good data traffic, when it's moving at a good speed, 
then you're much less likely to have issues with the packets getting lost. Your video data definitely will be much more reliable when you have the better connection. There's no way, unfortunately, to simply resend lost packets. Uh, by the time they arrive, they're no longer useful. So that can be an issue that simply cannot be solved. And I will be talking today about some of the most common reasons that you might experience that. There is a multi-point control unit called an MCU. Uh, that is a device commonly used to bridge the video conferencing connections. So it's an endpoint on the LAN that's gonna provide the capability for three or more terminals and gateways to participate in a multi-point conference. So essentially that's your hardware device. That's the hardware device that connects multiple locations through one video conference. And so this is something that if you have a hardwired video conference set up in your conference room, chances are you have a unit of this nature that you go through. Some of the most common issues that you are likely to experience when it comes to video conferencing, not being able to connect. Uh, this could be due to a number of different factors. It could be something as simple as somebody does not have their computer internet plugged in and they don't have their Wi-Fi turned on. It could be weather related. It could be, um, that they're dialing into the wrong location. So for instance, they're using the wrong web URL, they're dialing a wrong phone number. Uh, there's a number of different reasons why they might be unable to connect. Another simple reason they might not be able to connect is that the host has not joined the meeting yet. That's a pretty common reason. You'll be put into a holding location, basically a green lobby in some cases, or um, an on hold service with the webinar service for the phones, and you won't be able to talk to anyone. You'll be unable to connect. That will be true for many of the services if the host is not present. Zoom actually ran into an issue with that um, during the pandemic, of course, attendance on Zoom skyrocketed. And so many security flaws became evident with Zoom conference calls. You might have seen a lot of that in the news last year. Essentially, what happened was Zoom was a very trusting software. And that works fine in small groups. But once you start getting out to millions of people, the bad apples come out too. And so there were a number of issues. And one of the issues that came up during that period of time before they fixed many of these security issues was that it used to be a default setting that if you had someone invited to a meeting, they could essentially start the meeting before the host got there. And this ended up causing some issues when people were sharing links to join meetings and people that really weren't supposed to be in part of those meetings were able to get in there and start the meetings without the host. So there are a number of reasons why you might be unable to connect. In general, you're gonna to wanna to try and trace it back to figure out where in the process you're not connecting. And I'll talk more about that in a little bit. You might experience poor audio quality. And again, this can happen for a variety of reasons. Maybe you don't have a strong enough internet connection. Maybe there's other phone devices or electrical type of interference where there's other electronics that are interfering with the signal. If you think about it, if you're on an airplane, they tell you to turn off any of your electrical devices, your laptop, your tablets, your phone. It's because it can interfere with the cabin. It's the same thing for you. Other electronics can interfere with the signal that your device is receiving. This can also be weather related. Uh, so bad thunderstorms, snow, heavy snow, blizzards, high winds, ice storms. These are things that can impact internet quality. And then even poor wiring. If the wiring is degraded in the building that you're in, whether it's an old house, for example, or something where it's been exposed, maybe um, a rodent, for instance, chewed on the wiring. You know, there's a lot of reasons why you could end up with issues that would affect the quality of the audio on your video conferences. You might have issues with the call getting disconnected. Now, this most commonly is going to be a result 
of a poor internet connection. Um, assuming it's not someone deliberately hanging up, that's a pretty obvious one. Um, but most of the time, it's going to be that you don't have a strong enough internet connection to hold that video conference call. If you imagine if you're trying to download a movie on Netflix and you don't have a great connection, you notice how the movie kind of lags, the audio might get out of sequence with the video. There's a variety of things that can happen if you don't have a good internet bandwidth. And so the exact same thing happens with video conferencing. You might end up with lagging calls. You might have people disconnecting. They might not be able to hear the audio. They might not see the screen share correctly. Those are all potentially common issues with video conferencing. And most often, the base issue ends up being they don't have a strong enough internet connection. And there is a way that you can test that internet connection. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that later in this training. There might be no audio or screen sharing. You might be getting an error message when you're trying to share your screen or when someone else is trying to share their screen. Some of the clues to look for in that situation, was there some kind of a driver that needed to be installed in order for screen sharing to happen? That's getting less and less common as more companies are switching over to the app-based video conferencing where it doesn't require any download of software in order to do something like screen sharing, but it's possible that you still are using a system that would require that, in which case, if you don't have that driver installed, the screen sharing will not work. There can also be issues from a security perspective of the internet browser being used. And so it's not necessarily uncommon to have issues with screen sharing if you're using an unsupported internet browser. So you should make sure that whatever browser you're using, whether it be uh, Microsoft Edge or Google Chrome or Mozilla Firefox or something else entirely, that it is always up to date with the latest version of that browser. Uh, that will help to reduce any issues related to security that you might encounter. So when you experience some of these common issues, you're going to want to try and figure out obviously, what's causing them and what do you do to fix them? So what's the procedure that you're going to go through to try to figure out what is the problem you're actually having with your video conference? Let's take a look at some of the options. Start by asking yourself, is the network actually down? You know, we kind of joke about, is the internet broken? <laughs> but in reality, the network could potentially be down. So it could be an issue with your internet connection, could be an issue with the company's network, it could be an issue um, anywhere along the line potentially. So when you're trying to determine where's the actual issue, either start at the most obvious potential issues and work your way back or do it all kind of chronologically. So starting from uh, the computer, is the cord plugged in? Is it plugged into the wall? Is it on? Is the green light on? You know, kind of go through it step by step, every piece of hardware and software along the line in the process of connecting. So one of the ways you can test that, can you dial somewhere else, like another conference room? So if I'm trying to dial someone up on video conference and I can't get through, Am I able to call someone else? That would verify that most likely the problem is not on my end, it's on the receiving end. On the other hand, if I can't call anyone, if I'm getting no signal at all, then clearly the issue is on my end at that moment. You might have end user issues. Does someone in this have their system muted? Uh, if you're looking at a polycom type device, uh, your computer, your monitor, somewhere along the line, is the system muted? Should someone mute their system? Like if you have laptop speakers that are causing a feedback loop, for example, is the software up to date? Did someone change settings somewhere? Those are going to be some of the common end user issues that you might encounter that you would need to figure out how to fix. If someone has their system muted, you're not going to hear them, obviously, or they may not hear you, depending on where the muting issue is. That is something that can clearly be easily resolved 
by unmuting the system. So you'll see that commonly with the Zoom calls. You can almost always see it on the screen, the little microphone icon, and it'll have the international circle with a slash through it to indicate that it is not currently available. That is the visual cue to you that your microphone, for example, is muted. And so you can talk, 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 but no one else on that meeting is going to be able to hear you. Most of the time when that happens, people in the meeting will realize it and they will let you know that you're still muted, we can't hear you. For the should someone mute their system, this is something that a lot of people struggle with on their video conferencing. They just don't understand what's going on. One of the most common reasons that this needs to happen is that people have they're calling in on a phone, for example, but they're still having the meeting playing on their computer with the sound coming out of their laptop. And what will happen is the microphone from the phone picks up the speakers from the laptop and it creates a feedback loop. And so you'll end up with an echo where it sounds like someone is saying something, saying something, saying something, and you can hear it kind of reverberating that way. You might hear the really high-pitched sounds that kill your ears, um, those, those super loud speaker feedback kind of sounds. Um, that is commonly caused by technology interference. So that could be, again, something like having the phone on and having the laptop speakers on. It could be if you're using something like a lavalier microphone that's on someone's lapel and they're walking around and they get too close to the speakers in the room, that will cause that kind of feedback. So essentially, if you're hearing super loud audio in terms of interference, echoes, poor quality sound, things of that nature, one of the things you're gonna to wanna to check for, is there any other technology around that could be sending out a signal that's interfering? So if you're in a conference room, you're gonna look for speakers in the ceiling. You're gonna look and see where is their microphone placed. You're gonna see how close are they to any devices that could be sending out signals that are interfering with that audio. For the software being up to date, uh, you might be encountering issues recently because many of the internet browsers have now discontinued support for flash drivers, Adobe Flash. And so as a result, um, if there's any legacy video conferencing systems out there that require flash, they're not gonna work properly if flash is no longer being supported. So that's the kind of thing you might wanna watch out for. And if that is the issue, that's definitely gonna be involve your IT folks to fix it uh, because very often that means the webinar service needs to be updated in some fashion to not need to use Flash. Again, fortunately, many companies are moving away from that technology, and so it's becoming less of an issue over time. But you might see a bump recently because Google Chrome did discontinue support for Flash December 31st of 2020. So if it's possible, if you've seen something recently where it worked previously, but it doesn't work now, that might be part of the reason for that happening. And then that, did someone change the settings somewhere? If someone else set up your meeting for you, they may have gone in and changed some of the settings. And so Zoom is a prime example of that. There's a number of different settings that can be changed for security purposes and for other purposes related to how the meeting runs, whether or not things can be recorded, whether or not people can come in, are they gonna have chimes that'll ring when they come in? Is the meeting going to be locked at a certain period of time? Those are all examples of services that are commonly available on many of the webinar services where if someone other than you set up the meeting, they may have changed the settings and it may cause unexpected behavior to happen that you were not expecting. So if that's the case, stop and think for a moment about what's actually happening like if some if people say they can't get into the meeting for example and they're frantically sending you text messages saying i can't get into the meeting i can't get into the meeting some of the possibilities would be someone did change the settings on that meeting to lock the room automatically five minutes after the meeting started Microsoft Teams has recently rolled out this feature as well so that's another place where you might see this happen 
One of the things that you can do is keep an eye out for that and physically change the setting as the host to unlock that meeting that will allow people in. A less formal way of doing that is that a person may have set up a green lobby for attendees to wait in until they're approved to enter into that meeting. Uh, in that case, you might have people out in the lobby that need to be approved. When you are the host of that meeting, it's really easy to forget to look at that lobby and realize that people have joined after the meeting started and they need to be physically approved in order to join that meeting. Call issues. Is there something interfering with the call audio? This could be the physical wiring issues. This could be the weather. Uh, if it's physical wiring issues, you would obviously need to call in a, an electrician to fix something of that nature. There isn't a short-term fix for an issue of that nature unless you can physically move to a different location where the physical wiring is not an issue. And the same thing with weather. If it truly is weather related, you may not be able to work around that. But one of the things that you can try doing, and this will solve many issues, is try to be connected by wire, not wireless. So if you're using the Wi-Fi to connect to your video conference and it's just not holding the signal and you think it might be related to weather or a poor internet connection or something like that, maybe someone in the house is downloading movies and it's slowing down the network connection, the options you can try, first and foremost, connect to your router directly. Use one of the cords, it might be an ethernet cord, uh, depending on how you're set up, maybe you have a cable modem, um, but do a direct connection from your computer to your router. And also you might consider hanging up and dialing back in again to that conference call. Now that may depend on whether or not you are the host of that video conference and what will happen if you disconnect. And that's gonna vary by service. With some services, when the host leaves, the video conference ends. With other services, when the host leaves, the video conference can continue. Um, it might require that the host hand over controls to someone else. Um, it just depends on the service that you're using. So whatever service you are using, do a little testing in advance to see what would happen if the host left the meeting. Would that stop the meeting entirely or would that just um, allow it to continue with the people that are present in the room at that time? So that's something you'll need to figure out based on your individual service. It will vary by different companies. AV issues are something else that you might experience if you're in a conference room. Now, clearly many of us these days are working from home, still in a COVID-19 world, um, but the day will come that we are back in buildings. We have conference rooms, people are all in the same room together. And that day will also bring with it a malfunctioning projector. <laughs> that just happens sometimes. So is the projector actually functioning properly? Is it displaying on the wall, on the screen? Does it need to have a light bulb replaced? That could be the simplest reason why it might not be displaying on the screen. Is it plugged in? Is it turned on? Is it, um, does it have the correct source selected, the input source? Um, that is a common issue why you will see on the screen that the projector is working, it is projecting, but it's just not projecting what you want to see. Most commonly, that's because it's the incorrect input source. And so on the remote or directly on the projector, you'll see a button, most often called input. It might be called source, depending on your brand of projector. But when you click on that, when you press that button, most commonly, it will rotate through all the different sources available. And so the first thing you should check is, where is your computer connected to that projector? Say, for instance, it's an HDMI cable and it's plugged into the HDMI port. That's one that's kind of like a USB, except it's a wider and flatter cable. The, the connection at the end of it is wider and flatter than a USB. So if that is plugged in and it says it's HDMI 1 on the back of the projector in the spot where it's plugged in, you need to make sure that input source is HDMI 1. 
You might have an HDMI 1, HDMI 2. You might have a connection for the USBs. You might have a connection for a room laptop versus an individual's laptop. Uh, that's very common with projectors. So if it is showing the wrong thing, check to see if the input source is correct. Does the conference room computer need to be rebooted? This is the standard classic response that you will get from the information technology department. Did you reboot your computer? You all know anything goes wrong. Doesn't matter what it is. First question they ask you, did you reboot your computer? And the reason they do that is it probably fixes things like 90% of the time. It often does fix problems. So if you're having an issue in a conference room with a computer not working correctly with the projector, reboot both of them. In some cases, what the issue is, is that they need to go through the boot up sequence in order to recognize each other. So if the computer is not recognizing the projector, if the projector is not recognizing the computer, you may need to reboot them so that they see each other and then it may start working correctly. Uh, if you have issues with something like a webcam, is the camera actually enabled? This is not as straightforward as it sounds sometimes, especially on a laptop, because what you may find is that it needs to be enabled, first of all, on the device manager of Windows, if you're in a Windows machine, for example, it needs to be enabled by Windows to work. That's the first step. Usually that's gonna be on by default. It would be unusual that it's not on by default, but it can happen. It can get disabled for any number of reasons. So you'll need to enable the camera, but you don't just enable the camera inside of Windows. You will also need to enable access, which really means permit access to the camera in your web browser as well. So you'll need to go in to wherever browser you're using to the settings to enable it to access the microphone and to access the camera. This is not always allowed by default. And in fact, in many cases, it's deliberately for security purposes set to not allow anything to access it by default. So what you might need to do is go in and enable it in full, just in general, but also you may need to give permission for a specific website to be enabled. So for example, if you were to look at Google Chrome, you look up at the address bar, which lists the URL of where you currently are. If you look to the right-hand side of that, you'll see a little icon that looks like a camera. That is for access to the microphone and the camera. And if you click on that, it will ask you, do you want to allow access on the site you're currently on? And you can then grant permission to use your camera and your microphone. So that's a common reason on a laptop that it might not be working, that you might not be able to show your webcam. It's because it hasn't been permitted, permission has not been granted through the web browser. So it's not just the fact that it works in Windows, it has to be granted through the web browser as well. And if you're, when you're working with video conference services, it's very common that the microphone and the camera have to have permission through the video conference site. So in the WebEx settings, in, the, in my case right now, I'm using a site called AnyMeeting, uh, GoToWebinar, you have to grant permission very often in order for them to be able to access the microphone and the camera. Very common. So if you are experiencing any issues, whether it's audio or screen sharing or connecting or anything else, what can you do? What can you try to do to make it resolve itself? Well, here are three suggestions for you. The first thing is try to lower your bandwidth that you are using, especially if you're working from home. You know, this is less of an issue in the workplace where they might have a T1 line or some other very high bandwidth internet connection. But when you're working from home, you might not be working with the best internet connection. 
And so you should take a look at what else is using the internet at the moment you are doing your video conferencing. If you have kids home and they're doing e-learning, that is impacting your internet bandwidth. If you have um, a, uh, this is, uh, could be a teenager, it could be anyone in the household, doesn't have to be a teenager. If you have anyone in the household who is down streaming movies, uh, streaming television, uh, maybe that's Netflix, maybe that's something else, those would be examples of uh, things that take a lot of bandwidth. Those can really add up. There's a lot that can happen with that that can impact your ability to connect. So there is a website out there that you can access in order to test your speed. Um, the name of the website is speed test, all one word, speedtest.net. So S-P-E-E-D-T-E-S-T -E 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 dot net. If you go to that website, it will actually allow you to test your internet bandwidth. You can see how fast the download is, how fast the upload is. So that's a way that you can check and see what's your current bandwidth. And it might be very eye-opening for you to compare it when you are plugged in and connected by a cord to your router versus when you're using your Wi-Fi. Look and see how much of a difference there is. The other thing that can impact your bandwidth is this distance from your laptop to the wireless router. Because if you are, let's say, sitting down in your basement and your wireless router is up on the second floor in your bedroom or home office or something, then that distance impacts the quality of the Wi-Fi connection. So you want to try and lower the resources that are being hogged on the internet, which means stop any streaming, don't be playing Amazon Music in the background, um, don't have email running on your computer, don't have a bunch of other web windows open. So it's not that you need to close everything every time you get on a video conference. But if you're experiencing problems with connecting to video conferences, this is what you should do to try to reduce what is using the bandwidth in your home. So reduce, close any extra windows that are open, especially anything like email, anything that might have ads running in the background. Facebook can be an enormous bandwidth hog. Um, there's often videos running in the background. It's constantly sending notifications and feed updates. So things like that can be a drag on your bandwidth. So look for that first. Get rid of the, anybody who's streaming. Tell them they can't do streaming right at that moment. Do what you can to lower the bandwidth being used so that more of it can be devoted to your video conference. Redial. The internet is a very complex place for the way that it connects to the internet. And so sometimes a video call might get routed in a bad way. <coughs> Excuse me. And so if that's the case, hanging up and dialing back in a second time could fix the issue. So that should be one of the first things that you try. If you're having any audio issues, just like you would on a cell phone. If you connect on the cell phone and you're like, hey, this is a really bad connection, I'm gonna hang up and call you back. Do the same thing in your video conferences. Try hanging up and dialing back and see if that eliminates the issue. Worst case scenario, try restarting. Now, I would suggest before you go to this step, the first thing you try after disconnecting and dialing back in, if that doesn't do the trick, make sure when you disconnect and dial back in that you are closing the internet browser completely and then reopening the internet browser and then try again. If that doesn't do the trick, then you're gonna to need to try restarting your machine. That is an actual reboot. That is shutting down and restarting your computer. Uh, that may eliminate some of the issues that you are having. Um, and in some cases, 
You might find you have things like a pending software update, and that's an unfortunate time to discover it when you're in the middle of a video conference, but that might have been what was slowing down your performance if that was the case. So when I'm going to be on an important video conference, I try to restart my computer, say, half an hour, 45 minutes beforehand, just to clear out any things that might be hanging out in memory, anything that might be taking the internet bandwidth, anything that might be doing software updates. I don't want to find those kind of unpleasant surprises in the middle of an important video conference. So that's one of the steps that I try to take in a preventive fashion to try to eliminate some of the issues I might encounter. All right, so here is my process when there is an actual issue. This is really aimed at a conference room, video conference type of meeting. Um, start with the room computer. Reboot the computer that is in the room. See if that fixes the problem. Are all the cords actually plugged in and securely connected? And you might think, well, nobody's touched it since yesterday when we were in here before, but you never know. Maybe the cleaning crew bumped it with the vacuum cleaner. Maybe somebody unplugged it and plugged in their laptop and then forgot to plug the room computer back in. Things happen. So always double check from the wall outlet to the back of the computer, from the computer, the cord going to the projector, whatever. Check every connection and make sure they're all securely seated. Check to make sure no one is muted. Have them all double check. And when they're checking to see if they're muted, there could be a couple of different places that they are muted. So some examples would be, they might be muted on their phone headset. So their microphone on their headset might physically be muted. They might be muted in the software. So Zoom, for example, you can be muted by Zoom or you could be muted directly with your computer headset. Those are two different places and they could both be turned on. And so someone could unmute one, the other one is still muted, they don't under, you know, they can cause a little Abbott and Costello who's on first routine here. So make sure that they check every possible place that they might be muted. Try rebooting the projector. See if that fixes the issue and it recognizes the room computer. Check the projector source. That would be that input button that I talked about earlier. Might be called input, might be called source, but check to see if the projector is currently displaying the correct input device. Reboot the webcam. So if you're having issues with the webcam, those often can be rebooted as well. Now, not so much, I'm not talking about a laptop webcam here. I'm talking about although I guess you could theoretically, I'm talking about the room webcams where you have an actual webcam installed in the room, a piece of hardware that's separate from the computer. That may need to be rebooted during a video conference as well if it's not displaying properly. Hang up, dial again, see if everybody gets a good connection. Verify you are dialing the right URL. Verify you are calling the right phone number, verify you're entering the right PIN number ID, verify you are pressing the pound symbol after the PIN ID if it's required. Do those basics, verify, double check that you are going to the right location, right phone numbers, everything correct. If it's a web conference, try a different browser. If you're using Internet Edge, try Google Chrome or vice versa. Very often, for whatever reason, there's a gremlin in the machine and it doesn't work in one browser, but if you switch to a different browser, it clears itself out. So try doing that as a possibility as well. And if it is a web conference, you could try a different computer. So try someone's laptop, try your phone, try another way of connecting to that web conference. See if it's an issue with the one machine and it works okay on a different machine. So those are kind of the initial steps that I would take when I'm trying to determine in the middle of a meeting in a room, what's going on. I go through this list kind of methodically. Does this work? Does this work? Does this work? Does this work? And really make sure that I've checked everything. And this really does catch probably 95% of the common issues that you might experience while you're video conferencing in a conference room at work. So these are definitely worth checking. Some of them are pretty obvious and yet they are often missed. 
And one of the things I always used to absolutely positively hate was having IT come out and having it turn out to be something like the um, the wall plug had gotten unplugged accidentally and nobody noticed it. So always look for the obvious things too. And the advantage of doing that is if you do have to put a call into your information technology department, you'll be able to say, I've already rebooted the computer. I've checked to make sure the software is up to date. I've checked to verify everything's plugged in. I've done the basics. So what are some of the possibilities here? It makes you sound much more intelligent for that call, which we all love to sound intelligent. And it lets them know up front, I've already tried these steps. So clearly it's something a little bit more involved to fix this issue. So it's always worth trying to do that. So how can you prevent some of these issues in the first place so that they don't even happen at all? There's a couple of steps that you can take. Um, one is to do a dry run in advance of any video conference, especially if this is going to be a very large meeting, lots of people connected, you're going to want to do a dry run ahead of time. Some of the parameters for a dry run. Try to do it at the same time of day, like say a day ahead, two days ahead. If it's a really large event, several days ahead so that you can address any issues you might have and try a second dry run. The reason for that is you might experience different internet connections in the middle of the day versus in the evening versus in the early morning. A lot of times we test, we do our dry run test at a totally different time than we plan to do our actual live conference. That means that we might not be getting a true sense of what traffic on the internet is like at that time. Uh, and again, that's the example of kids might be e-learning at a certain time of day, People might be home watching television at a certain time of day. And if you're on a cable modem, that can impact your network, your internet bandwidth, which a lot of people don't realize. Um, so there could be some situations like that where you really need to get a true test. Secondly, make sure that if you're going to be doing a dry run, that everyone is on the actual equipment they will be using during the live session. So don't let them do a dry run test at home with their home computer if they're planning to go into work and use the conference room computer on the live day of the event. They need to be on the same equipment that they will be using on the day of the live event. You also want to try and do the, the tests of things like uploading any PowerPoint presentations and make sure when you do that, that you actually flip through all of the slides, verify that nothing in the webinar software is changing the slides because it's not uncommon with many of the web services that they do change the slides. They might resize them slightly so that the, the text flows differently on some of the slide pages. They may upload them as the equivalent of a PDF where it's removing things like animations and transitions that people are expecting. So you want to test all of the slides ahead of time and also watch to see how long is the lag time between slides from when the person hits next to go to the next page to when the next page actually shows up. How much of a lag is there so that whoever's speaking to go with those slides will have an idea of how long it's going to take for the people on the other end to, to be able to see the slides that they're looking at, or if they're doing some kind of a live software demo, to have an idea of how much of a lag there is for the audience. So those are some of the things that you can test in advance to make sure that you are ready for that video conference. Make sure that a uh, complete test of the slides is part of the process of doing that testing. You're also going to want to check their audio. So make sure you actually make anyone who's going to be presenting a presenter, verify that there's no software that needs to be installed, that there's nothing special they need to do, that they know how to operate the webinar software so they'll know what the various buttons mean in different areas, how to mute or unmute people, how to um, open up or close the PowerPoint presentations, all the basics. Make sure that everyone who's going to be a presenter is familiar with how that software works. On the actual day of the live event, connect early. 
It's not uncommon, depending on the kind of event, that participants might show up 10 to 20 minutes early. So you might want to have all the presenters be there 30 minutes early to sign in, verify there's no problems, nothing unexpected is happening, and then they can just go and hang out and leave their service connected. But that is something to definitely be aware of, that you need to be able to connect early so that if there's any last minute problems, you have some time to fix them. If it's an important event, you want to try and have a backup presenter. So in this case, this is someone who can step in to take over doing the slides if something happens to the primary presenter. That's going to be something like, uh, for instance, releasing company reports for stock um, for shareholders updates, things like that. For a regular meeting, you probably don't need a backup presenter. If it's a small meeting, if something happened to the primary person who was going to be speaking, you would probably just cancel and reschedule that event. But for a larger meeting, think about who could step in if Joe Schmo oversleeps and sleeps through their alarm or they get a flat tire on the way in and they can't get there to do the room. How would you handle it if the main presenter was unavailable? There's a second role that is well worth including for any really important video conference, and that is backing up the host. So I often was responsible for coordinating uh, reviews at my last company, and these would be events where they would have multiple people presenting throughout the day. So it might rotate person one, person two, person three, person four, person five. And there was one person who was leading the meeting. So they were physically in the room. They were present to you know, handle anything specifically that like attendees would be asking about. But because they were physically in the room running the meeting, they could not address any issues that might come up related to the video conferencing. And that's where I would come in. And so some of the things I would do would be to update speakers to let them know how the timing was going. Oh, they're running about 15 minutes ahead. They're running a little behind right now. I would also be a second person signed into that video conference so that if something happened to the connection of the first person, I could speak up and say, we're having a little technical difficulty at this moment, but we'll be getting this addressed. Please stand by. And I could make sure that the line stayed active and that everything worked fine. And that line staying active was important too. There are some video conference services where if there's only one person dialed in at that moment, the, the webinar service will allow you to stay active for a certain period of time. It might be an hour, it might be less. And at some point in time, it disconnects the line if there's only one person in there. Well, with these meetings that we were holding, because people were coming and going throughout the day, there wasn't always people on the video conference. Many of the people were in the room, the presenters were in other locations, so they were not always directly in the room. And when they would break, for example, for lunch for an hour, then everyone might drop off and dial back in at the end of the hour. Well, what would happen was the conference line would get disconnected if that was the case. And if you were recording that day's events, the recording would stop as well. And when you came back after lunch, you'd have to set up a brand new video conference because you couldn't restart one that was ended. So the advantage of having a second host in the room where I was actually designated as a host was that I had the ability to mute anyone who started their speaker, uh, who maybe unmuted themselves accidentally. I could go in and mute them, prevent them from disrupting the rest of the meeting. I kept the line open because there were always two parties on that video conference at all times during that entire day, even when they broke for lunch for an hour. And so we were able to record the entire day's sessions. And it's not just about recording, but even just keeping it open so that we could then continue when we came back. So it's really useful to have that second backup host. And 
I would also be available to answer questions in the chat. If people would say comments like I can't see, I could give them advice on how to troubleshoot the issues on their end. I could do all the things to make sure that the video conference went smoothly that the chair of the meeting could not do because they were busy running the meeting. So this is a role that is absolutely critical and helpful. Um, I could also make sure that the next presentation was uploaded. So the PowerPoint presentations were ready to go in the order they were supposed to go. The chair did not need to worry about uploading the presentation or opening up the file. I took care of that for them. So having a second person, even if they're not directly involved, in fact, it's better if they're not directly involved in the meeting, but having them available, dialed in on that webinar all day is actually incredibly useful for that kind of a complex event where people were coming and going, there were breakout sessions, there was a lot going on. So that's something I would strongly encourage you to do. Now, in some cases, I would literally just dial in on my computer and I would have a line going on my phone. I had a multi-line phone so I could dedicate one of the lines to this purpose. And then I would actually go and do my work and I would just pop back periodically to make sure there were no issues. So it's not necessarily something where you have to, you don't necessarily have to physically be in the room with them. Sometimes that's beneficial. It's not always required. It just depended. Um, in my case, we had a very large conference room that had a wall along the back with a desk on the back side of the wall. So I was often able to park myself there and be physically in the room but out of sight, so I wasn't disturbing anyone, and I could just sit quietly in the back, monitoring things, making sure everything stayed on track. So I would strongly encourage you to take a look at doing that, if at all possible. And then any time that you are working with a larger video conference, that you have something complex of this nature, have a plan in mind for how you are going to communicate if there are any problems. Are you going to send out a mass email to everyone to say something like, hey, we are running 30 minutes ahead. Please be prepared to stand by and make your presentation early. I'll try to give you a heads up approximately 10 to 15 minutes before you'll be expected to present. Um, so is that going to be a mass email? Is it a Twitter update? Is there a Facebook group? Uh, if we disconnect, what do we tell people? Do we tell people everyone hang up and try again 30 minutes later? What is our plan? So always think through what's my plan B? What's my plan C? If I had to throw together a new video conference on the fly because this one crashed and I needed to physically set up a new video conference, what's my plan for communicating that to people? So I don't get inundated with phone calls saying, I got disconnected, I got disconnected. How can I get back in? I can't, it won't let me back in. If you have a plan, people will know, don't call Marie to ask what's going on with the video conference. Instead, let's check our email <coughs> because we know she's gonna send us an email with any updates. So have a plan in place, communicate that plan with the other attendees, with all the presenters, make sure everyone is aware of what you're likely to encounter and how you're gonna work around it if you do. <clears throat> and also give people a heads up for things like, we're having weather difficulties in our area. You know, let people know about that, that if we have any problems, please, as long as you're connected, just stay connected. We'll try to get back in the line immediately. Don't hang up if the host gets disconnected. So something like that can be very helpful to let people know if something happens, here's what I should do. Because otherwise they'll be going, well, should we disconnect? Should we hang up? Are they going to try calling us and I'm on the line? So have a plan, communicate that plan to everyone involved in the meeting. So I hope that you have enjoyed this presentation for Executive Secretary Magazine Admin Chat. Come back here every week, every Thursday for a brand new video from some amazing speakers. There are just some awesome, awesome speakers that Executive Secretary Magazine has lined up for this series. And if you liked this video, please leave a comment below. Let me know your thoughts. Like the video, choose the thumbs up like icon, and also please share it. Let other people know about the Advent Chat series. Get the word out for us. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you've enjoyed this and 
I look forward to seeing you in my next admin chat, but hopefully you'll check out all the admin chats every week that are offered.